We'll go ahead and get started. Well, that's probably too, too loud. Once I turn it down just a little bit. You got it? All right. Looks like Advent is hit. We're a little light this morning. Makes me sad. So I'm kind of excited about today, although it might be a total blunder and mistake. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a different attack. Uh, this is the, the last day of the first half of the year in Bible study in the Old Testament. We have moved through what we want to call Torah and Covenant. The establishment of God's presence in a box for the salvation of the world from the sin into which Adam willingly cast us. In the spring, we're going to move into another kind of half of that history, kingdoms and exile, uh, where the history takes several really fascinating turns. Uh, uh, Quite a bit of change takes place. Uh, In this, though, we're all about trying to see the cross, right? Trying to understand how this is Jesus' Old Testament. Uh, How in every single verse, really, he is there. Uh, If not rectilinearly, directly one-to-one, the virgin shall conceive and bear a child, uh, then typologically, as a picture, as foreshadowing, where you have type and anti-type, Christ being the anti-type, and this overlap exists uh, where we see uh, pieces, hints of uh, uh, inklings about how and who and what Christ is and what he will do. All of this, again, being about a very real history, though. These aren't just pictures. These aren't just stories. Right? Uh, there was a creation. There was a fall. There was a flood. Uh, there was a Mount Sinai. Uh, there was a donkey that talked. Uh, all these things, right? Well, today, then, if we were going to, I mean, I don't know if this is really uh, in terms of space here to really uh, be to scale. But if we mark that halfway point where we move from Sinai into the time of Judges, and remember Judges is this spiral into unbelief that kind of mirrors the time of the flood as well, when uh, uh, God destroys everything, that from Adam on there's a spiral into deeper unbelief. Um, Hidden in this little time period is the book of Ruth. That's really easy to overlook. Uh, And easy to think, you know, this is just one of those those stories. Ruth and and Esther uh, both read as as great stories. They really are. You could sit down and read them in an evening as a short story. We don't really do that as a culture anymore, but they're fantastic. Fantastic tales. They make good movies. They've been made into movies multiple times because of that. Um, And yet it's, it's often the easiest place to miss Christ, because the story is so good. You think it's about love, or you think it's about self-sacrifice, or something like that. Um, and it is, but in, only in the, as these things point to Christ. All right, so as I was preparing to how to try to pull all that out for you today, I pulled out uh, a sermon I preached on Ruth uh, back in Philadelphia uh, quite a few years ago now. This is back when I had time on Sunday morning to preach 30-minute sermons. Did you believe that? Uh, it is one of my favorite stories. My first, like, three or four weeks there, an old gentleman named Clyde uh, pulled me aside and looked at his watch and said, Pastor, that was 30 minutes. It's a little long, don't you think? And I said, yeah, you know, no one goes to Bible study, so I just do it in church and uh, keep doing it. <laughs> and uh, um, the, the good part of the story was after I left, the vacancy pastor, first week he's in, he preaches 15 minutes. Same guy pulls him aside, pastor. That was only 15 minutes. Cutting it short, don't you think? Yeah? <laughs> was, no, you get used to it. Anyway, so th- this is a long sermon, and I pulled it out to, to kind of review for myself because I, I felt like it was one of the, the better ones I did that year. We did a whole year in the Old Testament. Um, and uh, as I was doing that and trying to think, you know, how can I present this, I finally just decided, you know what, I should just read it to you guys, give you copies, uh, we'll go through it, and, um, and be, there should be time for questions at the end as well. Um, so again, something different, not the normal way we do Bible study. Um, it may not work, it might be really boring, and if it is, I apologize. Um, but I, I think this, this does a great job of pulling out, you know, how, how is this about Jesus? Uh, how is this Old Testament in this particular time? Uh, pointing us to, to what he did on the cross for us and who he is for us eternally. So, uh, if you don't have a copy, 
Please raise your hand and ask, because there's, where'd you put the extras? In the back on the circle table. There you go. So there may be some things about Philadelphia in here, and I'll maybe pause and explain that when I mention it. Uh, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. After the death of Joshua, when there was no king in Israel, and each man was doing as he saw fit. As you remember, when the people of who Yahweh had promised to bless the entire world through began to abandon his word, and so began to lose faith in the promises, and so began submitting themselves to gods who were not gods. And as they did this, they were submitting themselves to oppression by anybody with a sword and an army. In those days that we have just come through, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in the territory of the tribe of Judah went in search of food off to the east across the Jordan River in a country called Moab. He took with him his wife and his two sons. His name was Elimelech. Elimelech means God is king. But there was no king in Israel. Least of all was the Lord revered on and believed on as king, even though he had sworn to his people in their covenant to be their husband and father. What good are promises like that, though, if you don't believe them? What good is a father to you if you don't listen to him? Or what good is a king if you refuse to keep allegiance to him? So after the death of Joshua, when each man is doing as he saw fit, there was a famine in this land, and this man named God is King leaves Israel to dwell among pagans in search of food. There was no king in Israel, but God had plans to change this. And this is the beginning of that story. God had plans to change the arrogant, fruitless, doing as men saw fit, not only in Israel, but in the entire world. Having been entrapped in ourselves to worship our own hearts and our own minds and our own hands by trusting first and foremost in our own emotions, our own, um, excuse me, I just lost my place, our own thoughts and our own works, the children of Adam have long wrought havoc upon this our creation subjecting it to futility by our faithlessness, so that now, under our weight, you can see it groaning, almost as if it has expectation that something must change, that something must be different, that something good must replace us. All the wars that you see, and the earthquakes, and the suffering, and the famines, all the places where you know that men's hearts are growing cold, or you see lives spinning out of control, or treachery and reckless conceit dominating relationships, addiction to pleasure, all these things are the birth pangs of a world subjected to futility, rather than being destroyed in its entirety, so that the one who subjected it might also come and set it free from its bondage to corruption. It's all Romans chapter 8. God wants to release everything back into the freedom which he first intended to give us when he made us and called us good. But in order to do that, the world needed a new king, someone not like Adam, someone to inherit the world from him. But he, Adam, uh, is the thought, fa- uh, he, uh, what does that mean there? Yeah, He, Adam, the father of death. Hmm. Why is that capitalized? I must, that's what's confusing me. Yeah, I, he's the father of death. It must be redeemed. Yeah, that shouldn't be capitalized. He, Adam, is the father of death, and the world must be redeemed from him and bought back from him, brought under a new headship, a better rule, a perfect kingdom. The world needed a new king. And the world got a new king in the one man Jesus, as you know. Born of the likeness of the sinful flesh of Adam, born under the law, he redeemed you who are under the law of sin and death by inheriting your fallen kingdom and bearing up all of its epic failure in himself, doing what we are unable to do, taking the throne which Adam had earned for himself and all his children, that is, taking the cross, condemning death in the cross in order that the righteous completion of all human reality in himself could also be given to you imputed to you, you who walk now not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit of God, that is to say, you who believe in Jesus. This reality, this word, this Spirit, promised and believed on, has already set you free from the law of sin and death, period. Once you had no king, 
Now you have a king, our Lord, Jesus, the Christ, dead and buried but raised, and now ascended to the heavens where he reigns over everything. God is now literally king as a man, though we do not see it yet, to be sure. We will not see it all until he comes again, so that, so that is what we are looking for. No one hopes for what he already sees. But God is king. And we then, sojourning in a pagan world where food is still rather hard to come by, and where each man is still doing as he sees fit, storing up futility for himself and herself and their selves, building up perhaps one stone upon another, cities which we then tear down with our own hands and minds, because we sojourn where there is really no king. There is no king in the United States. And even in those lands today where you can still find a petty king or a despot or a dictator of any, every kind, there is truly no perfect king, because there is no king on this planet. But God has, is, and will change all of that. Now the book of Ruth is the beginning of this story as a story about the king. God as king went down to Moab, and he took his wife and his two sons with him. Now there they took Moabite wives, which, as a general rule, wasn't allowed for the people of Israel, unless those wives entered into the covenant. That is, unless they first came through faith to trust in the Lord, to recognize him as the one true God, and to begin worshiping him as well. So for Ruth and Orpah, this would have meant coming into a home that was quite different from any other home they had ever known. One in which there were no idols set up on the mantle, no altars at which the family gods were worshipped. Where are your gods, they must have said. Our God is Yahweh, they heard, the one true God. He rules all heaven and earth. This God has no image, they went on. He is not created, nor does he dwell in houses built by men, but he has covenanted with us Hebrews so that we worship him in his holy tabernacle where he covers all of our shame and promises that he's going to bless the entire world through us. You don't say, they might have replied. This is not like the other gods we have known. Oh no, they would have said back. There is no God like this, for he alone is God. Join us, receive his promises, his blessings forever. And like that, a faithful marriage was possible, and Ruth and Orpah joined this family, living in Moab more than ten years, until not only does Elimelech sadly die, but also then both of these young men die as well. And so you have Naomi, the mother, left without a husband or sons, and effectively destitute, both she and her daughters with her. It's easy at this point in the story to let our hyper-prejudiced ears scoff at how these women were suddenly destitute. I mean, didn't they know they could just go to college and get a degree? Or at least plant some food in the field and be farmers themselves? Now, here we're a little spoiled by the dramatic effect that Christianity has had upon Western civilization, creating a world where for all intents and purposes, a woman can safely walk down the street in most parts of the most cities. Then again, the times are changing, are they not? How safe would you feel walking alone, a white woman, from 69th Street to 40th Street in western Philly? Uh, that, that is the ghetto, and you wouldn't. You would never walk there. I would wager it would still then be far safer there than to be a foreign woman in a foreign land out harvesting by herself in a field that she does not own in the middle of the day in Moab. Even back in her homeland in Israel, both Ruth and Naomi later live in danger. Because in a world where each man can do as he sees fit, a woman is not safe. Because a woman is, generally speaking, not as physically strong as a man. And without another man to protect her, a wicked man who has seared his conscience can do whatever he wants to a woman who he finds alone in a field. All this being the sad reality of our world, a reality that we tend to hide from behind the fumes of a Western society built in a belief in moral absolutes, yet a society whose take is rather empty and whose fumes are quickly dispersing. All of this being a reality, Naomi and her daughters arise and return to Judah, where they will be a little safer because there, her husband's lands are still owned by her. No other man can own or work those lands without first promising to protect her and her family. 
But as she begins this journey, she also tests her daughters. It's a strange kind of test. It's a test of faith. Go, she says. Return to your mother's house. May Yahweh the Lord, the one true God, deal kindly with you and grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of a husband. And then she kisses them and she weeps. But it's a strange test because it is a test of faith. Go and receive blessings in your homes of old, she says, where gods made of silver and wood still sit on the altar. Now it is mainly mocking Yahweh. The, is it mainly mocking Yahweh the Lord at this point? And I'm not really sure. What is clear is that Naomi is despairing. She's pressed down to the point of death. And she is weeping hard over the tragedy that has befallen her. And who can really blame her? And yet, no, the daughters say, we're going with you. When Naomi is in a fit at this point, she turns back, she says. What have you to do with me? I can give you no husbands, no life, no hope. Turn back. My own God has turned against me. So call me bitter now. That's my new name. That's who God has made me to be. Now at these words, Orpah does leave. She returns to her people and to her gods. And yet at this, Ruth, the pagan Moabite, the convert, shows more faith than Naomi, the one born and raised as an Israelite. Stop your urging, she says to Naomi. I am not going to cease following you. I am not going to cease going where you go. Your people are my people because your God is my God now. And if you die, then there I will die too. But I have come to believe in this Yahweh, the Lord, and there is no God like Him. He alone is God. He has visited and redeemed you as the people of Israel, raising up for you a horn of salvation, speaking to you by holy prophets, promising to always save you from your enemies and from the hand of all who hate you, swearing to your fathers to show you mercy, to remember your holy covenant, act upon the oath that he has sworn to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and grant to you that we, being delivered from the hands of our enemies, may serve him in faith and without fear all the days of our lives until the true Son will visit you from on high, the Messiah, giving final light to all who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. He is coming to guide all feet into the way of eternal peace, eternal shalom. Do not, Naomi, ask me to leave that. The Lord your God strike me dead in my path if anything but my own death parts me from you, my mother, in this faith. And to that, Naomi doesn't say, a thing. Now, it's Pentecost as they get back to their ancestral lands, the season of harvest. And in the households that are bordering them, there are several distant relatives whose fields are ripe. As is custom, according to the Levitical laws, when the Israelites harvest, they do not reap the field all the way up to its very edges. Nor do they gather every gleaning that falls to the ground as they pass by, but they leave for the poor and for the traveler. So learning this, Ruth begins to glean in the fields of a man named Boaz. It just so happens that Boaz is a man of his own field. He works his field with his people, with his men and his women. And he comes to see then that this woman, not of his house, is walking among the gleanings of his field behind his workers. Now I think there's a little doubt that he at this point sees her as beautiful. For the story of Ruth, I think there is little doubt that he sees her as beautiful, right? So he's actually slightly smitten with this woman already. For the story of Ruth is a love story, if ever there is one in the Bible. It's a true story of love and chastity, of hope and the gift of marriage. Boaz sees her from a distance and he calls to his lead man, who is this woman? When did she come here? She is a Moabite, he said. She came back with the widow Naomi. She worked very hard all day long. Now hearing of the distress of this woman, Boaz, his heart goes out to her even more. Whatever glimmer of romance lifted in him, though, it is hidden behind the restraint of his duties to his God and his people. More than this, Boaz is not a young man. He is well into what we would call his late middle years, and Ruth is still young. So though he may look on her with fondness, he can hardly expect interest from her to be returned. But this doesn't stop his love. 
His mercy overflows. Listen, daughter, he says as he approaches her. Stay in my fields. Walk with my young women. You will be safe from harm here. And none of my men will assault you in secret. Why do you do this for me, she asks. Because, he said, I have heard your story. I've heard what you've done. The Lord will repay you for your favor because he is the God of Israel and you've taken refuge in him. So how then can I not be his mask in order to reward you for this faith? As he leaves, he then gives instructions that she should eat from his people's food during the day and take some of that food with her to Naomi at night, as well as that his servants should leave purposely behind entire bundles of barley on the ground for her to glean from it. So that that night, she returns to Naomi with so much food that they don't know what to do with it. Yet Naomi is excited. Yahweh, bless this man. Which man was this? Who did this for you? Boaz, Ruth says. Boaz? Boaz has great kindness even to we who are as good as dead. But more than this, this is a kinsman of mine. This means he is a redeemer according to the Levitical laws. And that means he can purchase our land for his own land should he wish to also take one of us to wife and bring forth children from our line. But even so, that's a little outrageous. Let's dismiss this idea. It is a good thing that he has given you protection in his field because I've been afraid all day you've been assaulted while out by yourself. So from that day forward, Ruth keeps close to the young women of Boaz's household, gleaning until the end of both the barley and the wheat harvests, and returning every night to the home of her mother. At the end of the season, Naomi and Ruth have been given a lot of time, and it can't be doubted that Ruth herself, at this point, has come to see in Boaz something possibly more than a father. Now the text tells us nothing specific about love or besotted hearts. We are kind of spoiled in our age to think that romance must be rash and full of passion and somewhat reckless. Love, true love, is much deeper than the fleeting shadows we tend to chase after and call love today. Here is what you must do, Naomi says as the harvest is coming to an end. If you perceive that you desire him to be our redeemer, I do, Ruth replies. Well, Naomi goes on, you must follow the customs of our people and you must reveal to him that you would be his wife. So this night, he is working in the threshing floor, which is something of a great celebration, a party, a great deal of food and drink. So she says, bathe, anoint yourself with oils, put on your fine cloak, and when you have entered the festival, don't make yourself known to him. Wait until he goes to sleep. Then go and lay yourself at his feet and just uncover the feet to the ankles. This is a sign to him that you desire to be married and a sign of your submission to him. When he sees you, he will tell you his own mind about this. All of this, Ruth does exactly as she is instructed to do. And when Boaz, a bit merry with wine, lays down to bed against a heap of grain, Ruth comes softly and lays at his feet. In the middle of the night, Boaz wakes kind of suddenly. He's not really sure what caused him to wake up, so he turns over and notices a woman lying there like a slave. But his feet are uncovered. He can't see her face in the darkness, so he asks, Who are you that would propose such submission to me? I am Ruth, she says. I am your servant. As Yahweh the Lord has spread his wings over Israel, I desire that you spread your wing over me. For you are my redeemer. Now at this, Boaz had to be moved. What restraint, restrained emotions welled up in him immediately come forth in the joyous words of the text. He had not dared to hope against hope that the woman he'd been watching from afar in love, yet whom he had committed to serve as a daughter, could possibly turn her eyes toward him, a man so far past his prime. Yahweh the Lord bless you, he says. You have made this kindness to me greater than the one you have shown to Naomi. For you have not sought the passions of young men, nor the heat of young love. So fear not, for I will do to you all that you desire and more. I am your Redeemer. Now he sends her home this time with a cloak filled to the brim with fresh barley, and better than this with the promise that he is going to do everything in his power to become her husband. There's a little more to the story that we're going to have to skip over today, 
It's brief in the text, but we've got to get ahead. Boaz, in the end, takes Ruth as his wife, and there is love here, for he knows her, and they bear a son, a son named Obed. Now that may seem a little irrelevant at first glance, but Obed would grow one day to have a son of his own, a man named Jesse. And Jesse would grow to have many sons, the youngest of whom would be named David. And David would be the king of Israel. David would be the king of Israel whose throne would never perish and whose house would never fade by the promising word of God. David whose sons would eventually bear a daughter named Mary. Mary who would be found with child from the Holy Spirit and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. Jesus who would be just such a redeemer as Boaz. Only so much more. Not just for one woman, but for the entire world. And so for his bride, the church, of whom are you? Jesus' name is the greatest of all renown. He is the restorer of life and the nourisher of all ages. His kingdom shall have no end. Jesus is where this story is going all along, even since all mankind fell and in Adam's fall. And after God had been promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob that from their seed is going to come the warrior who is going to smite the demon's head, so then after he leads Moses to bring these children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob out of Egypt and out of slavery with a mighty hand so that they can live in freedom in this promised land, so that from that land, after the death of Joshua, when they forget that God is their king and they begin to each do as they see fit, God can nonetheless remain faithful to his plan to fix everything through them. His plan has always been and ever will be Jesus, the king whose death brings resurrection to the world, the king whose second coming you are still waiting for. God began that plan by first giving a king to this nation, Israel. And with that story, we will continue in the coming weeks. In the meantime, today, relish the story of Ruth, this forlorn woman who deserves nothing, but who hears the promises of a true God who has foretold that he's going to save the world. And she believes these promises. And so she becomes a great image of us, the church, an image of faith. The true God will be my God, she says. His holy people will be my people, she says. His death will be my death. His life will be my life. So this way do I intend to die in this faith, no matter what may come. And may I be, and I mean this word, damned, if anything, even the threat of death, should part me from Jesus. Indeed, this faith is what happens when the promises of God are made in you. As St. Paul just preached to us this morning in Romans chapter 8, in Christ, the true Redeemer who has brought back the children of Adam from their depravity, there is now no longer any condemnation. None. Even though your body will still die because of your sin, your spirit lives within you because Christ imputes himself to you. And the Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. So now that he is in you, you too will have this life. He also has promised to raise your mortal body when Christ comes again, in peace and for eternity. It is certain then that between now and then, the sufferings of this present time aren't even worth comparing with the difference that's going to be revealed at the final harvest. Neither height nor depth nor angels nor demons, death nor Life, nothing in all creation is able to segregate you from the shepherd and husband and redeemer and king, Jesus Christ. What more is there to be said than that? In tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, poverty, danger, violence, even though you are killed, even though someone should take your life, your goods, your fame, your house, or your wife, though these all be gone, the world can harm you none because God is for you. And who will be against you? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for you in order that he might graciously give you all things. He is Boaz, and you are Ruth. And this is not a command, it's a promise. Hmm. I might change a few things in that, but I think it gets the idea across. Oh, come here. The story that we skip over, uh, yes. Uh, 
I don't know. Yeah. Screen and full battery. Thank you. I, I kind of noticed that. I'm sorry. Hopefully you could hear for the most part. Um, the, in the Levitical Codes, it is, and it kind of, it, it says that in the, in the sermon, but um, if somebody, if, if a husband dies, there is a kind of a legal plan for taking care of the family, and it's all connected to the land. Because as you remember, once they inhabit Israel, each family gets a portion of land that can never be taken from them. If, if you were to go bankrupt, you could sell the land to somebody else in order to get out of your bankruptcy, and after seven years, they'd have to give it back to you. It was, uh, every seven years. And then there was a big one every 50 years called the Year of Jubilee. Part of that then, though, is you could actually get the land permanently within the same family by marrying someone who had, had deceased and having your sons be his sons. And they keep his name, but it's still kind of your family. And it's, it's sort of like expanding the kingdom by marriage sort of thing. And that was called redeeming. You're redeeming uh, uh, the land for the family and, and the woman for the family for the sake of the lineage and, and, uh, and the name. Um, so what, what Boaz has to do after he says to Ruth, I'll do everything I can, is he has to go to the, uh, the gates of the city because according to the line of secession, he is not the first one who has the right to be the redeemer of, of Ruth. Uh, so he goes to the, the city gate where the men would meet and talk, and he finds the man and, and he says, you know, I would like to redeem Ruth. Do you pass on your rights? And, and he says, yes, I pass on my rights. Uh, so Boaz then becomes his redeemer. Uh, redemption is a word that we use in Lutheran doctrine a lot because it is about exactly what Jesus does for us. He buys us back from, from death, right? From despair, from poverty, from being cast out. Uh, the fact that this is a Moabite woman is all the more amazing. Right? And the fact that she has demonstrated her faith to Naomi, you know, I expounded on those words there a little bit uh, in that conversation between her and Naomi when she says go back, but you can look, it's right there in the text. Orpah leaves and she says, my God's your God, I'm not leaving. My God's your God, I'm not leaving. Huh? It's not, I love you, Naomi, I can't leave you because I love you so much. It's, I love you so much because I'm your daughter in the faith. There's no way you're going to take away this faith from me and send me back to a house where I have to worship idols. Not a chance. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, and then so she comes in and is brought back through this faith right, into a marriage from the lineage of which comes the kings. Yeah. It's just it's such cool stuff. Um, it's a setup for, for what comes next uh, in, in the, the coming weeks. We're taking a two-week break for Christmas, I think. Maybe it's three weeks. Um, uh, and then we'll be back with uh, uh, the first king who's from a different lineage. Doesn't work out so well, Saul, uh, uh, after that. Um, but, got some time here. Questions about the story? I know we skipped over the text. Maybe you have questions about Ruth you'd like to ask. Questions about anything we've covered um, all the way from Adam on? Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes and uh, would like to use that if we can. You're so used to me talking. Yeah, go ahead, Joyce. Is it significant that her name was changed to bitterness? And Mary does that? Means bitterness? Oh, I don't know. I didn't know that. I'd have to look into that. But um, if so, yeah, I would say that's, that's very, at least historically, you know, Mary was a common name for Jewish girls. Very, very common. And I'm not exactly sure why. It would kind of make sense if, you know, the, the relationship in this book to David led to her being, many children being called Mary. Um, is, oh, I'm sorry, I should repeat it. She asks, if it, is it significant that um, she changes her name to Bitterness, which uh, is connected to the name Mary, which also means bitterness, and how that, that connection is drawn. And again, I, just, I don't know the etymology of the name Mary enough to speak on that. Um, but it, it, it is significant. And, you know, Names in the Old Testament are so different than the way we use names today. Um, and I, I don't mean to be insensitive, but it's kind of like the way Indian names work, right? Uh, dances with wolves. They name him that because he actually dances with wolves. Uh, Hebrew names are intended to be who you are. And so when a name changes or where you would claim a name change, you, you are literally abandoning who you are and becoming this other actual thing. 
Now, for us, names are all about an, in, uh, in, uh, inheritance or, or heritage. Usually, we're named after our family members and whatnot. Um, but all the names in the Bible are given by parents or by God because of the meaning. And sometimes I think it's sad that we don't translate them as the word, right? So, you know, Elimelech went down to, uh, uh, to, to Moab. You know, big deal, right? But God is king went down to Moab. And he just ended a book, Judges, where there's no king, right? And now God is king, is doing something. You miss that if you don't know that that's... And, and when they're saying Elimelech in their language, they're not hearing it as anything other than God is king, right? Um, so it'd be as if you were to, you know, call uh, everyone else by the meaning of their name, which I would appreciate, seeing as my name means gracious gift from God. And I would love it if you would call me that every time you talk to me. Because <laughs> it's true, right? It's so true. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, that she changes her name to bitterness is pretty massive. And I, don't, I haven't looked up what Naomi was, uh, what no, Naomi meant. But I'm sure that's, that's important too. Um, those names are never given without reason in the text. Uh, so, good question. Huh? Anything else? I've got to give you guys more time for questions more often because... Not right. You should be flush with confusion. Mm. Nothing. Nothing. All right. Um, let me think. I can. I can come up with something else. Uh, da 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 da. Hmm. Ah, oh, good. Well, she may not be beautiful, right? I think she is. I think, at least in his eyes, she is. Um, oh, sorry. It's for the video. I need to keep repeating questions. If Ruth is so beautiful, uh, why is she passed up by the one man? Um, I'm not, I mean, she may not be beautiful, at least, in, and the way we look at beauty today, too, is very different. We have so much to compare everybody to, and we're all trying to be that image. In, in the ancient world, I mean, if you had all your teeth, you're pretty good looking, you know? Uh, so, so, no, I, I wouldn't put too much on that. Chances are, why is she passed up? Whatever familial relationships exist with this other man, he does not want to interrupt that, right? So, I mean, maybe he's already got two wives bickering at home, and he doesn't want to bring a third into that situation. But I'm bumped. Shh. It's supposed to be a joke. Yeah, um... Uh, and you know, it's clear that Boaz, I think, is, is unmarried. Uh, and so there's, there's something to that. Plus, I mean, maybe it's just Boaz convinces him too. He, like, he doesn't even know. He's like, oh yeah, sure, I'll marry her. And Boaz is like, well, I would like to. And he's Boaz's friend. Well, sure, go ahead, buddy, do it. Yeah? We're, we're just not given enough of that information. Um, but what is clear, so I don't know if she's beautiful, but what is clear is that Boaz does see her in that way underneath all of this in a very reserved way, unlike the way we would have it today where you're out, you know, singing in the rain about it. He is, he sees her and, he, and he, he wants to do what is right for this woman. But he also is aware that she's young and he's old. Yeah. That's what's so gorgeous about it, you know. It's like the reverse of Camelot. You know the story of Camelot, right? Where uh, uh, the younger has to marry the older and then Lancelot comes in and sweeps her away and it all falls apart. It's like the opposite of that story. It's backwards, where she could have gone after younger men, and she doesn't. Right? Um, uh, she, she loves him for the sake of the family and the covenant and the words of God, uh, and, her, and for her mother, who she continues to serve in this. Um, it's, it's the kind of love we just don't think about as Americans. For us, it's always passion when we use that word. Even if I'm talking about pizza, I love pizza. It's, I have a passion for pizza. Right? Love in the Bible is fidelity, faithfulness, steadfastness, charity. Yeah. Words that we just don't use enough, right? So, and that's, that's what makes this story so gorgeous. And then in all of this, that fidelity is about God's fidelity to you in Christ. Right? That's what it's all pointing to. That's what Christ is doing on the cross, is having that charitable love that withholds his hand from the passion, which is wrath, and instead is faithful to his creation, redeeming us. Yeah? Oh, Gorgeous. One more and then we'll be done. So, the Right. Right. 
both. Yeah? So the question is, when she uncovers the feet, it's described as an action saying, I, I want to be married. But then Boaz says, you are lying there like a slave. This, this is, again, uh, as Western feminized Americans, we can't even begin to see that slavery in the Bible is not what we did to the blacks in the 1600s. Slavery is being given to the utter care of another human being. And there is no greater slavery than a woman to her husband in marriage. It is the, it is the most phenomenal of gifts in which it is a picture of us to Christ. And if we don't like that, us, that other stuff, then we can't like that us to Christ either. Yeah? She is in total submission to him because in the true goodness, he is in total care and protection for her. As Paul says in Ephesians 5, what fool would stab himself in the hand? That's the fool who harms his wife. Right? Your body to head. Yeah? Um, and in, in Hebrew law, the slavery they speak of is such as that. You, you cared for yourself. It was a good job. You had a good permanent job with a retirement plan. I mean, it, it, all you couldn't do was like run away. Yeah? Um, and even then you could do that every seven years. You could, you could get out of it. I mean, it, it, it's totally a different thing than sort of the racially driven, evolutionally driven, right? Slavery in America is all based on the black being a lower form of human because they're, they're less evolved than we are, right? Totally different thing, right? Now, the, does the Bible advocate slavery? No. Does it teach that we should enslave people? No. The New Testament is very clear that ownership, is, it wasn't, it's not about owning a person to use them. It's about being given authority over another to protect them. So compare it to uh, parents and children. Imagine if the baby, as soon as the baby is born, was free. Go ahead, live. You know? What's it going to do, right? It must have someone with total authority over them for quite some time. Huh? Otherwise, it's going to kill themselves. And they try, even with the authority there. They keep trying. Gosh darn it. Man. So, so that, that's what's going on there, is she, is she is doing both. But she's not just asking to be any old slave. She, the, the foot thing, it's about the slavery of marriage which we have to hear through the fidelity of the cross of Christ to us, that, that the, the picture of marriage and husbandry in the Bible um, is not what we see uh, in the attack, that, the, the thing that had to be attacked by feminism, and it should have been, that what, what we came to, to think of as patriarchy, this domineering man is better than woman thing, which again is evolution. Um, that's not what the Bible is talking about either. Man is the head uh, as the servant protector whose job is to take the pain and the suffering and die in her place. For the sake of the kids, too. I mean, that's really what it's about. It's for the sake of the family. Um, sake of the church. Sake of the life everlasting that he's done it, right? It's all pointing to Christ. So, marriage and headship. Fun stuff. Awkward in our emancipated era. And emancipation, I mean, good thing, right? Don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating slavery. Not advocating spousal abuse. Um... Uh, but I'm advocating a, a different view of the words in the Bible uh, than often our culture will give us. So, all right, I think that takes us to a good time. Um, thanks, for those of you who've been here like every week all the way through this, what a ride. Thanks for sticking with it. Yeah, uh, I hope you come back in the spring because we, we're not done. There's lots coming. And the best stuff, I, David's my favorite. I just love David's stories. So um, that's coming up real quick. Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for being a husband to us, uh, like women lost in the wilderness, uh, at the mercy of those who would tyrannize us, at the mercy of the devil, and at the mercy of our own flesh, and yet you have bought us back. You have looked on us with compassion and, and brought us close to you, giving us uh, more than we deserve, beyond what we could earn, uh, a feast to know no end. Uh, please bless us with faith in this, and that as we study your Old Testament words, we would continue to be drawn into our trust in your cross uh, and uh, bind these words to us, to our hearts and minds in such a way that we become capable of confessing them, uh, that we would proclaim these good deeds among those who do not yet believe them and have them indeed join us uh, in these studies and at, at the altar here at Bethany. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you.